Hello and welcome to another episode of Script to Screen. I'm your host, Mark Bauer. This is a talk show where I interview local writers and filmmakers of the Iowa City area. Today my guest is Rob Merritt. Hi, Rob. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Good, good to hear it. Now you are you have quite a few ties to the Iowa City area. You graduated from the university. Yeah, yeah, I was a double major of theater and journalism back in the day, and uh, I've lived in Iowa for most of my life. So, um, yeah, I've always loved it here, and I've really been a big supporter of the the arts and creative scene here because there's an incredibly amount of talented people in Iowa working. And if you're not from here, oftentimes people don't know that, but uh, it never seems to surprise people when they come out and they see something that was, you know, if they see a, a play at Theater Cedar Rapids or they see a film that was made here, there's really, really strong people in the area. And so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm proud to be part of the arts community here. You are a theater specifically, would you say, is your main interest in terms of the arts, or do you have an interest all over? You know, it's easier for me to explain what I'm not into. Yeah. I have way more interest than I have time to do. I am an actor. I'm a, uh, I'm a playwright, screenwriter. I, I've driven, I, I drew a graphic novel years oh, back. Really? Uh, I, I've, I've kind of dabbled a little bit in everything. I just, I, I have so many interests and not enough time to pursue them all. I'm also a hardcore film nerd. So one of the, one of the long-term goals that I had was that one day I, I, you know, I wanted to, I'd already done playwriting, but I wanted to do a screenplay. I wanted to get into that side of it. And um, so it's kind of nice that you know, Amelia 2.0 has finally made that possible. But um, yeah, I, I, have a, I also have a really strong love for the stage. I have been an actor with um, Theater Cedar Rapids, City Circle, Iowa City Community Theater, Dreamwell, University of Iowa when I was here. And I've written, I've written multiple plays. I'm working on a few right now. So I, I've kind of been, I've kind of been a, a little bit here and there, everywhere. How many plays have you produced? Uh, I'm, uh, wow. Well, <laughs> if I go all the way back to when I was a student at Iowa, um, maybe the better question is how many quality plays yeah. have I produced? <laughs> I mean, obviously the most recent one was the Summerland Project. And that play actually came about because I hadn't written a play in like, oh boy, wow, about 15, 14, 15 years. And then Theater Cedar Rapids began something uh, called the Underground New Play Festival. And I saw it as an opportunity to finally, you know, I hadn't written in a while and I kind of needed something to just give me a kick. When the festival came along, it was right around the time that I had an idea for a story and I thought, you know, if I can get this written in time for the deadline and get it submitted, then I could, you know, then maybe this would be a great avenue to tell the story. And there was a story that I had been working on for several years trying to figure out the best way to tell it, which was if you had the ability to bring someone who you lost back and talk to them again, would you do it and what would you say to them if you could? Essentially, the, the story of it is so you have, um, you have this young couple, Carter and Amelia Summerland. And Carter, uh, Carter's a police officer, Amelia's a school teacher. They've been married for three months. And Amelia suffers an aneurysm, which leaves her bedridden. And she's in a condition known as locked-in syndrome, uh, which is a terrifying and very real medical condition that happens to people where you are, um, you are fully awake, fully alert, you can see, hear, feel everything, but you cannot move. Can't move anything. Um, you can maybe you can blink, and Amelia's been like that now for two years, trapped in that, and her body's dying. And Carter uh, has done everything he can to try and save her, and he's looked into every alternative medicine procedure he can find, and he knows she's dying, and the t and that time is running out. He gets approached by a company called Wesley Enterprises, who are looking to build the first ever, uh, the, the, the first ever digital recreation of a human brain. The company finds Carter's case appealing because they know that Amelia's dying and because they know that her brain is still fully functional but her body's not. And he's resistant at first, but he agrees. 
And so they take her and they do this process. But once they introduce Carter to her, she's so, um, I mean, she's, she's loaded with all kinds of errors and there's things that aren't working correctly. And she winds up seizing up, which to Carter comes across as she's in like horrible agony. And he comes away from it like, I, I, I made a horrible mistake. I should never have allowed this to happen. And he tries to get the company to shut the project down. They are like, we've invested so much money in this, and this has been such a long process, and you signed all the papers to give us consent to do this. No, we're not going to shut it down. Mm -hmm. Then you have the issue of he goes to a, um, a very right-wing, very professed Christian United States senator who has been opposed to work like this because he is arguing that human beings have souls and that the idea that you can copy a human brain is an insult to anyone of the Christian faith, or really of, of anyone who believes that there's an afterlife or if there's a God that's looking out for us um, would have religious objections to this. And he goes to that senator and he says, well, this is exactly what they've done with my wife and I want it shut off. And so what you wind up happening is you have her husband and the religious right coming in saying you have no right to do this and this is this is wrong on a moral and ethical standpoint you have a company that's saying this is a technological breakthrough and we and this is our intellectual property and we're going to pursue it and then at the same time amelia continues to make improvements and she continues to get closer and closer to the amelia that she was before and once she finds out what's happening she steps in and is like, actually, I should be the one who makes this decision, and I want to be able to continue existing. And so she's arguing that she doesn't belong to Wesley Enterprises, even though they built her. She doesn't belong to her husband, even though he had power of attorney, that she should be the one who makes this call on what happens to her. And so you have this whole big debate happening. And meanwhile, Amelia continues to advance. And she's advancing at a rate that is beyond what doctors would have expected. And she learns to do things like she learns to play the piano in three days. Um, all these strange side effects of the fact that her brain runs in a different way now because of the whole digital construct. And, and, that, and that was what I wanted to do because there are so many questions around something like this. I didn't want to write a story that was like, okay, here's how you should feel, here's the good guys, here's the bad guys, and here's the story. I wanted it to be, wow, I, who is right? Uh, would you say that this play is a grounded humanist story with sci-fi elements? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it uses elements of science fiction to get across its ideas, but this is not a, I mean, but I, I mean, it's technically a science fiction mm -hmm. film, but it, it's exploring themes that are very, very universal. And I don't think you have to be a science fiction fan to relate to it. Because anybody can relate to that, anyone who has lost someone that they love can relate to the idea of, what if I was faced with this question? If, if someone said to me, hey, your friend is dying, but there's a procedure that we can use that might be able to save them. Only thing is, it's going to involve doing all of these really unorthodox things. <laughs> Are you okay with that? You had originally, you mentioned you started this play with the Underground uh, Festival project. Mm -hmm. Sorry if, if I butchered that. Um, but it was essentially an underground play to begin with. Right. And then you took it to theaters, Cedar Rapids. I assume there was maybe a bigger budget involved, maybe more resources. Yeah, yeah. Well, what happened was, um, so we did the Underground Festival play. It had two performances down in the basement theater at, at TCR. And it was completely volunteer production. And, um, but it struck a chord with a lot of people. And there were two people who came to see it, the artistic director of Theater Cedar Rapids, Leslie Charper, and the tech director, Derek Easton. They both came to it, and they both afterwards were like, there's so much more that could be done with this if you put a big budget behind it, put it on a bigger stage, we could, you know, you could get a much wider audience. And so Leslie wanted to put it on the main stage season for Theater Cedar Rapids the following year. And I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Uh, it was not something that I thought was ever going to happen, but I was like, yeah, I would love that. 
And so about a year and a half later, the show went up on the main stage. And it was a, it was a very different feeling production because now suddenly all of these video elements were being incorporated and it had a much bigger set. And um, it just, you know, it just overall had a more polished feel than the original one. And in terms of audience, you know, the like opening night, there were three times as many people in the audience at opening night as came to see the entire run of the original Underground Festival show. And, and it, on the main stage, it ran for four weeks. So a lot of people wound up seeing that show in the course of its run. And it was, it was exciting for me as a writer after you know, the Underground Festival was like, it was my baby. I mean, I directed it. I designed the, the, the set. I designed the set. Yeah. We had tables and chairs. I designed the set. Um, we, it, was, it was so much a labor of love, and it was very much me and those seven actors. When we got to the main stage, all of a sudden, it was Leslie Charper directing it, who's brilliant. It was Derek Easton designing it, and all of these really cool uh, audio-visual thoughts he had, um, Jim Cropa doing sound design for it. You had a whole new cast. You had just, just these, all these incredibly talented artists. Uh, Joni Sackett bringing like, like this costume design that was kind of futuristic, but very grounded in the reality we know. Um, just all these other artists bringing their ideas to it and making it into something much bigger than it was before. And that was really exciting as a writer to watch happen. It was also exciting to realize that you could take this story and it could be performed very minimally in a tiny little theater. Or it could be put on a big stage with tons of tech elements. And it worked either way. In different stagings of this, you had some actors play different roles. I know in one staging, uh, the actor who played Carter later played the character of Max. Yeah. Uh, what was that like, seeing the same cast but in different roles? Uh, I, well, Matthew James, any, anyone who has been to see Matthew James in a show in the corridor knows that he's probably one of the most brilliant, if not the most brilliant, um, actor in the area. He just, he be, any role he plays, he just becomes that guy. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a, real, it's a real testament to his ability that in the first production, he played a grieving um, police officer who descends into depression and basically madness um, and perfectly pulled it off. And then a year and a half later, he plays this he, he plays this, compu this completely nerdy computer technician with all of these, and he puts this Andy Warhol spin on it, and he's just like this weird dude. And I have so many people who actually saw both productions, and they were like, that was the same guy? Yeah. Like, he looked different, he acted different, he moved different. And um, it was also fascinating to see a role like Amelia, which is an incredible acting challenge, to play someone who um, starts off not moving like an actual person and, and just completely screwed up and, and having all kinds of weird impulses and then get her to the point where by the end she's acting and moving completely like a normal person and having to figure out how to get there, that's really difficult to do. And the original actress who did it, uh, Katie Slavin, you know, she pioneered a lot of that and, and she was brilliant. And then when Angela Billman took it over for the main stage, uh, Angela came up with brilliant things and found a lot of new stuff. And then when Angela went on to do it in the film, she kind of had to reevaluate it again because now she had to figure out how to make those things work on screen where your movements have to be even more subtle and nuanced. And, um, and, so, and then I saw a production of it in Kansas City where there was an actress who played Amelia. And she had come up with all kinds of really cool new stuff. And so, yeah, so it, it's, it's fun to watch actors take this thing and make it their own and, and go in directions that, as a writer, you would not have ever thought of. And that's been, that's been great. After seeing it on stage and having it produced, you've seen success. People are responding to it. People are debating about its messages and themes. When did you decide, OK, I would like to adapt it to a screenplay? It took some convincing. Yeah, um, I've, I'm a huge. I, I love film, and I, um, I love film. I love stage. 
One of the things that really appealed to me about the Summerland Project being a stage play was that you don't usually see topics like this explored in the theater. And I thought that made Summerland Project really unique. So I remember there were, there were people that asked me about it after the, the Underground Festival production. There was, there was a friend that came up and was like, all I could see was movie. And I was like, no, no, not <laughs> this. I have movies in my head, but this one's not one of them. And then when the main stage one went up, I heard that from more people. And then finally, Mary Meisterling uh, in Cedar Rapids, she asked me to coffee and she was really interested in producing a film version and, you know, kind of kind of tried to convince me that, that we should go this direction with it. And, you know, and at first I was like, I don't, I don't know, maybe. And then I, I went and I thought about it and I was like, well, the thing is, there were so many things about this story that I really did have to scale down to make it work on stage. But I thought, but the advantage is I can do all these things on film that I can't do on stage. I had just finished doing a movie with, uh, with Adam Orton, who was at the time, um, he was living in Chicago and um, he was a native, he was from Iowa. He was a, a Kennedy graduate and he had done a few short films while he was still living here and I had done one with him as an actor. And, uh, and we'd stayed in touch, and so I told Mary, I was like, well, why don't we bring Adam in, since he, he's connected to here. Adam drove in from Chicago and met with us, and Mary decided he was the right, the right guy for it. And so the process just kind of started to pick up momentum from there, and the first thing we obviously had to do was generate investment, like interest from people, in order to have the funding to make the movie. And so w what we did was we shot a, we shot like a fake trailer. Mm -hmm. I figured out as a writer how could, we knew that we wanted Angela to, to play uh, Amelia. So I was like, okay, so let's, let's make a trailer where, where she's doing that. Um, and we didn't know how else we would cast it besides that. So I was like, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we, I'll play Carter just for, you know, for this. And so... Um, so we filmed one of the we filmed the scene where Carter and Amelia meet for the first time, and then we, a, as a writer, I figured out how many scenes can I put in here where I can fake it to make it look like we have a full movie, mm -hmm. but Angela and I are the only actors appearing in it, and so we we made this we made the fake trailer and then we shot a full scene, and then we went around with those two clips showing them to people at investor meetings and saying, this is what the movie could be, here's what it could look like, because we didn't want to just talk about it, we wanted them to actually see it on screen. And that process took, I think we were, we were working for a solid year to try and raise funding. And, and at the same time, I'm working to convert the play into a screenplay, which was kind of fun, creating new characters and at the same time going in and figuring out uh, you know, because I could make new scenes and new locations, uh, I got to basically play with Amelia and Max and all them again and, and write whole new scenes for them, which was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, uh, we were working with producers out of L.A. who started getting an interest going on their side. And it's, uh, it's an interesting process working with those folks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things they would... They would they were big proponents of screenplay formula, the whole save the cat thing, all that kind of stuff. And so they were looking at the original script and saying, well, you know, you have to have this beat and you have to have this beat. And I'm like, well, you're not understanding. This isn't, you know, this, this isn't like the story of Carter, mm -hmm. which is what you guys are trying to turn it into. It's, it's an ensemble thing. Every one of these characters has a story and every one of them has an arc. And um, so there was a lot of back and forth and so some of what's in the screenplay was the result of me just going, hey, I'm going to expand the world and do this. And other things were because producers wanted this, producers wanted that. They wanted me to change this and that thing. And, and there would be a lot of back and forth. And I'd be like, all right, well, I can, I can write this in. I can. And in some cases, it would lead to some cool ideas. It was, it was a long process making, it, making the, the story translate. So we got to the point where we had investment, screenplay was done. And, um, and then over the summer of 2014, they got the green light to go ahead. And so at that point, they, they started casting and 
uh, started pre-production, and the movie started filming in, uh, I think, September 15th, 2014, was the first shooting day. Were you involved in the auditions or pre-production process no. at all? No. Nope, I was not. Um, I was very, very involved pretty much right up until I turned in the screenplay. My, my script went off to become a movie in the hands of, of other artists. And, and uh, so, yeah, so it was, you know, it's, it's a, there's a, another big difference between stage and film is that on stage, the writer really stays involved, clear up to the creation of the final product. In film, it does not work that way. In film, it's very much a director and producer's medium, and writers are constantly changed out. Um, you have teams of writers that work on things, and you have people that do script polishes, and it's uh, and then once they get on set, the actor will be like, well, you know, I was kind of thinking yeah. that maybe I should change the line to this, and the director's like, well, let's give it a shot, you know, or or the actors are like, you know, we're just going to completely improvise this, and see what happens, you know, and and that's just that's how film works. So um, yeah, and and there were changes made. I looked at you know. If, from the final screenplay that I turned in to the film that was made, a lot of changes were made. Uh, entire characters were removed. Um, entire scenes were changed. And, I mean, you know, as a writer, you're like, every time that happens as you're watching it, you're just like, oh, uh, you know, that, I, I did not say that. But, um, but that's just how it works. Um, not to put you on the spot necessarily, you mentioned it was maybe a little hard to watch some scenes because it was changed. How do you feel about the film as a whole? Well, here's, here's the thing. Um, I was on set when they made the final season here a decade ago. I was working for the Gazette at the time. And they shot the final season. It was, it was the true life story of the Norway-Iowa baseball team. And, and it was crazy. I mean, they had Sean Astin here and Powers Booth and um, Rachel Lee Cook. And, and it was a, a fairly decent budget film. And David Mickey Evans, who wrote and directed The Sandlot, was, was directing it. And I remember the huge amount of pride and excitement that was in the Cedar Rapids, Iowa City area because this movie was being made here. And this was when we had the Iowa film tax credit. And it seemed like we were on the verge of this whole explosion of filmmaking coming here, sort of like how it did in Georgia. And there were people who were moving here because they were like, I can make my career working in film in Iowa because there's gonna be enough opportunity. And then the whole Iowa film program just crashed and that all went away. And a lot of people were really heartbroken. And one of the things that we really wanted to see happen with this film was to see that come back being there at the premiere uh, on Friday and seeing how people were reacting, there was so much pride. Th and I hadn't seen that since the final season had been made a decade before. And I'm looking around and I'm looking at these people who, they're proud of the local actors that are in it. They're proud of all the local people that served on the film crew. And they're, they're proud of the fact that it was written by someone from here, directed by someone from here, stars someone from here. And there was all this enthusiasm. People going, well, what's the next movie going to be? Who, who's going to shoot something else? And I was just so happy to see that. So I'm really, really proud of what the movie seems to have inspired in people and what it seems to be bringing about. Um going along with keeping that momentum, uh, are you working on anything currently? What do you see yourself working on next? I'm actually, right now, I'm in the process of, a, uh, I was hired to adapt uh, a science fiction novel into a screenplay, and I'm about halfway through that project. And um, I also have a couple scripts of my own that I've been developing for some time. There's, there's, there's one that's a follow-up to uh, the Summerland Project slash Amelia 2.0 that I've been working on for years, which I never had any intention to do until I kind of realized that the first play had opened up all of these questions and had only explored some of them. And I realized there was a whole other story that could be told. And so I've kind of been developing a follow-up to that. Uh, I'm, I've been developing a script about the only woman in U.S. history to win the Medal of Honor for service on the battlefield, uh, Mary Edwards Walker. That's been a project that I've had going for some time. So yeah, basically I have a whole bunch of 
irons in the fire right now. I keep doing silly things like I played John Proctor in the Crucible last <laughs> spring at TCR, which was great fun, but of course took up three solid months of time. Yeah. Didn't do any writing during that time. So <laughs> my, my only thing is I need to, you know, <laughs> I need to buckle down and get back to it. But uh, yeah, I've, I've got a whole lot of things kind of in the fire and we'll see what happens. Has uh, remaining an actor and staying active in that way helped you as a writer when you're writing dialogue and story? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that as an actor, I've learned to recognize what scripts I really respond to as an actor, um, how to write things that give actors room to take it and run with it. I have a writing technique that I kind of call it, um, I sort of, I totally stole this from a monologue that's in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead where they talk about how you can be on a ship and the ship is traveling from point A to point B. Now while you're on the ship, you can go above decks, you can go below, you can travel to the front of the ship, you can travel to the back, go wherever you want. You have that freedom of choice. But you can't change the fact that the ship is still gonna end up where it's going. And that's what I kind of try to do is, as I write a script, I have an outline where I know for each scene it's gonna, it's gonna start here and it's gonna end here. And within that, you know, I'm gonna let the characters run wild and say whatever they want, and who knows what'll happen, as long as the scene ends up where it needs to end up. Well, uh, one question I would like to uh, close with is, sure. do you have any advice for anyone looking to get into film or theater, whether they're a writer or an actor, just from your experience? Yeah, do it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds flippant, but it's true. If you want to be an actor, go audition for stuff. Go do it right now. You don't have to move to L.A. I mean, if you want to be a movie star, yeah, eventually at some point you will have to head that way. But don't go around telling everybody, I'm going to be a movie star one day. No, go audition. There are, there are so many community theaters and professional theaters and so many student filmmakers and amateur filmmakers in just in this area and they're all looking for people go you you will nothing will make you a better actor than doing it and continuing to do it and with every experience that you do you will learn something um, if you want to write then write there's you, you've never had a movie produced okay write scripts until you do um, and Write for the stage if you, if you want to give that a shot. Write for the festival or write a full-length play and submit it. Keep submitting it to people. Just make sure that you're doing it. If you want to be a musician, play every day. Whether or not you're getting gigs, play. The best advice that I could give to anybody who wants to succeed in the arts is do your art. I never would have thought that I would be able to have a movie produced that without leaving Iowa. I would have just assumed, hey, if I'm gonna make it as a screenwriter, I have to move to LA, and I've gotta work there. Nope, I'm still here, and Amelia 2.0 just came out. So yeah, if somebody wants to succeed in film or on stage, if they wanna succeed as an actor, or as a writer, or as a film director, go pick up a camera, or go sit down at a computer, or go to an audition, and just make it happen for yourself and just keep doing it. That's the best advice I can give. Some very sound advice from Rob Merritt. Uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, I had a good time talking to you, getting your insights. Well, thanks, yeah, and, uh, and, if, and, if you, and if you wanna see Amelia 2.0, you can download it on Amazon or on iTunes or on Vudu. Uh, there's a number of places you can get it. And uh, yeah, it, and if you do, I mean, you're supporting local filmmaking. This thing was completely produced here, and if it is successful, it will open the door for other films to be produced here. So it's, uh, it's, it's something that we're all pretty passionate about. Yes, very good. Uh, thank you, Rob, for being on the show. Thank you for watching this episode of Script to Screen. I'll be seeing you next time.